ergonomics, also known as human factors engineering, aims to create safe and productive workplaces by studying the physical and cognitive demands of work. The goal is to design or improve workspaces, tools, equipment, and procedures to reduce fatigue, discomfort, and injuries while achieving personal and organizational objectives. Components of an ergonomics program are as follows. Health surveillance, monitoring of worker health to identify jobs with high risk of injury. Review of existing data, analysis of workers' compensation data, OSHA logs, and clinic logs to identify high-risk jobs. Walkthroughs, observational assessments of job tasks to identify jobs with excessive risk factors. Discussion with employees, engagement of employees to identify demanding job tasks. Risk factor checklists, use of checklists to identify high-risk jobs and tasks. Detailed analysis of high-risk jobs, identification and prioritization of risk factors in high-risk jobs or tasks. Engineering and administrative strategies, identification and implementation of strategies to reduce the most important risk factors. Pilot intervention, testing of strategies for a period of two weeks to two months to ensure effectiveness and avoidance of new health problems. Mock-up or prototype, Use of a mock-up or prototype to uncover potential problems as tasks are simulated. Feedback loop to continuously monitor and evaluate the program's effectiveness. The overview of ergonomic factors in the workplace refers to the various elements and conditions in the work environment that can affect the health and safety of workers. These factors include physical, cognitive, and organizational elements, and they can contribute to the development of musculoskeletal disorders, stress, and other health problems. Some common ergonomic factors in the workplace include Physical demands The physical demands of a job, such as repetitive motions, awkward postures, and heavy lifting, can lead to musculoskeletal disorders, such as carpal tunnel syndrome and low back pain. Workstation design the design of workstations, including the arrangement of furniture, equipment, and tools, can impact worker comfort, posture, and efficiency. Poor workstation design can cause strain, fatigue, and injury. Lighting, adequate lighting, is important for visual comfort and task performance. However, glare and insufficient lighting can cause eye strain and headaches. Noise, prolonged exposure to excessive noise levels can lead to hearing loss and other health problems. Vibration, Whole body and hand arm vibration from operating heavy machinery and equipment can cause injury and discomfort, such as hand arm vibration syndrome and carpal tunnel syndrome. Temperature and humidity, extreme temperatures and humidity levels can impact worker comfort and task performance. Work pace and workload. Work pace and workload can contribute to stress and burnout, leading to physical and mental health problems. Organizational factors. Organizational factors, such as job design, communication, and decision-making processes can impact worker satisfaction, motivation, and well-being. A well-designed workstation should allow workers to perform their tasks in a manner that minimizes stress and strain on their bodies. This can be achieved through proper positioning of equipment and furniture, adequate space for movement, and appropriate adjustments to accommodate individual needs. Some key considerations in workstation design include Equipment placement The placement of equipment, such as computer monitors, keyboards, and telephones should be positioned to minimize awkward postures, such as reaching or twisting. Desk height The height of the desk should be adjustable to accommodate different workers and allow for comfortable working positions. Keyboard placement. The keyboard should be positioned at a comfortable height and angle to reduce the risk of repetitive strain injuries, such as carpal tunnel syndrome. Lighting, adequate lighting, is essential for reducing eye strain and improving visibility. Work surface. The work surface should be large enough to accommodate all necessary equipment and documents and should be positioned to minimize awkward postures. Ergonomic chairs, comfortable and adjustable chairs, are essential for reducing fatigue and strain on the back and neck. Footrests, footrests can help to reduce strain on the legs and feet, especially for workers who spend long periods of time sitting.
ergonomic principles for workplace design aim to reduce sustained awkward postures, reduce contact stress, and design work based on anthropometric data. This involves designing tasks, tools, and workstations to prevent sustained awkward postures such as neck or trunk flexion, extension, or rotation, shoulder elevation, elbow flexion, wrist extension, finger extension. Hard surfaces and edges should be rounded and padded to minimize contact stress, and support should be provided where necessary. Workplaces and machines should be designed to accommodate both larger and smaller workers. Body dimensions refer to the physical measurements of a person's body, such as height, arm length, and reach distance. By considering the critical body dimensions of both adult men and women, employers can ensure that the design of the workplace, equipment, and tools accommodates workers of different sizes, allowing them to perform their tasks without having to make awkward postures, reach too far, or strain their muscles. Range of motion, ROM, of a joint is important for the physical demands of work, because it determines the amount of movement that is possible at that joint. If a worker's joint has limited ROM, they may have difficulty performing certain tasks or movements required by their job, which can lead to discomfort, pain, and an increased risk of injury. Examples of range of motion exercises. A. Flexion the bending of a joint. B. Extension, a movement opposite to flexion in which a joint is in a straight position. C. Rotation, pivoting a body part around its axis, as in shaking the head. D. Abduction, a movement of a limb away from the median plane of the body, the fingers are abducted by spreading them apart. E. Adduction, moving toward the midline of the body or to the central axis of a limb. F. Circumduction, a combination of movements that cause a body part to move in a circular fashion. G. Supination, extension of the forearm to bring the palm of the hand upward. H. Pronation, movement of the forearm in the extended position that brings the palm of the hand to a downward position. I. Inversion, movement of the ankle to turn the sole of the foot medially. A neutral posture occurs when the muscles are relaxed and the joint is naturally aligned, typically in the midrange of motion for that joint. When a joint is not in its neutral posture, the muscles and tendons are either contracted or elongated. The neutral posture allows for maximum control and force production, while also minimizing stress on the muscles, tendons, nerves, and bones. Awkward postures occur when the joint moves away from its neutral posture towards the extremes of range of motion. Worker's highest force, produced when the joint is in neutral posture. Moving away from neutral posture, decreases force as muscle fibers contract, or elongate. Bending the wrist, causes loss of force, due to tendon friction. Awkward postures, require more energy, to produce the same force. Avoiding awkward postures, is important to prevent MSDs and early onset of fatigue. Work should be conducted at 15%, or less, of maximum capacity for ideal task design. The neutral position of the wrist is when the wrist is in a straight alignment with the forearm without any bending or deviation in any direction. The fingers are also in line with the forearm and are not flexed or extended. Elbows are relaxed, beside the upper body, and are bent at a right angle, 90 degrees to 110 degrees. Elbows are not, lifted upward, and, or outward away, from the upper body. Shoulder neutral posture, typically means, keeping the shoulder in a neutral position, with the upper arm hanging naturally, at the side of the body, and the elbow at a 90 degree angle. It is important to avoid elevating, or protracting the shoulder, as this can cause muscle strain and fatigue.
The neutral posture of the back technically involves a slight forward flexion at the hips. But when lifting objects, it is important to maintain a non-flexed posture to avoid placing unwanted forces on the spine. This non-flexed posture is often referred to as the neutral posture of the back when lifting or performing other tasks that involve bending forward. When lifting or performing other physical tasks, it is important to avoid twisting or bending the waist as this can place excessive strain on the muscles and other tissues in the lower back. Disc pressure varies depending on the position of the body during activities. The lowest disc pressure is in the supine position, while disc pressure is highest when lifting weight from a seated, forward-leaning position. Standing exerts less pressure on the back than most sitting positions, preserving the natural curvature of the lumbar spine. Sitting upright exerts 40% more pressure on the spine than standing, while sitting with a flexed spine adds about 30% more pressure. There are several factors that can affect the physical demands of lifting and handling objects, including weight of the object. The weight of the object is the most important factor in determining the physical demands of lifting objects that are heavy or awkward to handle can place significant stress on the muscles and joints of the back, neck, and arms. Height and distance of the lift. The height and distance of the lift can also affect the physical demands of lifting. Lifting an object from the floor to a high shelf, for example, requires more effort than lifting it from a low shelf to a higher shelf. Body posture. The posture of the worker during the lift can also affect the physical demands of lifting. Bending, twisting, or reaching can increase the physical effort required to lift the object. Frequency of lifts. The frequency of lifts can also affect the physical demands of lifting. Lifting heavy objects repeatedly over a short period of time can be more physically demanding than lifting the same object less frequently. Torque is a measure of the twisting force that can be applied to an object. It is a product of the force applied and the distance from the pivot point or axis of rotation. In ergonomics, torque is often a concern when handling tools or equipment that require twisting or rotating motions. Lifting a load of 150 N, approximately 15 kilograms, can result in different forces on the base of the spine, L5S1. The two different methods of lifting are with the legs relatively straight, stooped position, and with the knees bent, squatting position. The estimated anterior shear force at L5-S1 is 500 N when lifting in a stooped position and is only 340 N when lifting in a squatting position. However, the spinal compression force is 1800 N when lifting in a stooped position and rises to 2700 N when lifting in a squatting position. This is due to the longer horizontal distance from the spine to the center of gravity of the load in the squatting position. This causes the load to exert more torque on the spine and increases the compressive force on the lower lumbar discs. Squatting is often avoided by workers as it takes more time, requires more energy, is hard on the knees, and often results in reduced ability to balance on the feet. Optimal lifting styles are those that balance the trade-off between shear force and spinal compression force. The guideline weights are used to determine if a load is too heavy to handle, which increases the risk of injury. The guideline weights are different depending on the work zone, high or low levels, with arms extended, etc. The boxes in figure contain the guideline weights for lifting and lowering in each work zone.
If the load weight is greater than the guideline weight in a specific work zone, there is an increased risk of injury. It is important to reduce the weight of the load when there are repeated operations to minimize the risk of injury. The repetition of the same movement or series of movements over an extended period of time can lead to musculoskeletal disorders and other types of injuries. The weight guidelines for an operation should be reduced by 30% if it is repeated once or twice per minute, by 50% if it is repeated 5 to 8 times per minute, and by 80% if it is repeated more than 12 times per minute. The Naoshi lifting equation is a tool used to evaluate the level of risk associated with manual material handling tasks, specifically those involving lifting, lowering, and carrying loads. It is used to calculate a recommended weight limit, RWL, for a given task, based on a variety of factors, such as the weight of the load, the distance it is being moved, the height of the lift, and the frequency of the task. The Naoshi lifting equation takes into account the six factors as following. H equals horizontal location of the object relative to the body. V equals vertical location of the object relative to the floor. D equals distance the object is moved vertically. A equals asymmetry angle or twisting requirement. F equals frequency and duration of lifting activity. C equals coupling or quality of the worker's grip on the object. Horizontal multiplier, HM, horizontal distance, H, in CM, from the midpoint between the ankles, to the hands while holding the object. For example, if the horizontal distance between the midpoint of the ankles, and the hands is 45 cm, the HM factor would be 0.63. This means that, the recommended weight limit for the lifting task would be adjusted downwards, by a factor of 0.63 in the Naoshi lifting equation. Vertical multiplier, VM, the vertical distance, V, in CM, of the hands, from the ground at the start of the lift. For example, if the starting height, of the hands is 80 cm above the ground, the VM factor would be 0.99. This means that, the recommended weight limit, for the lifting task, would be adjusted downwards, by a factor of 0.99 in the Naoshi lifting equation. Distance multiplier, dm, the vertical distance, d, in cm, that the load travels. If the the vertical distance is 45 cm from the start point, the dm factor would be 0.93. Asymmetric multiplier, a m, asymmetric multiplier, a m, is a factor in the Naoshi lifting equation, that accounts for the degree of twisting, or bending of the body during lifting. It is measured in degrees and can range from 0 degrees, no twisting or bending, to 180 degrees, maximum twisting or bending. Frequency multiplier, FM, the frequency, F, of lifts and the duration of lifting, in minutes or seconds, over a work shift. As the time between lifts and the duration of lifting increases, the FM factor decreases, indicating a greater risk of injury due to fatigue or overexertion. Coupling multiplier, CM, the quality of grasp, or coupling, C, classified as good, fair or poor and depends on the body position, either standing or stooping. Here is an example for calculating the recommended weight limit, RWL, using the NIOSH lifting equation. Suppose a worker is lifting boxes from the floor to a shelf, with the following lifting parameters. Lifting distance, D, equals 70 cm. Horizontal distance, H, equals 30 cm. Vertical distance, V, equals 125 cm. Asymmetric angle, A, equals 30 degrees. Weight of box, L, equals 20 kg. Frequency and duration, F, equals 5 lifts per minute, with a duration of 8 hours per shift. First, we need to calculate the multipliers. DM, 
distance multiplier equals 0.90 from table hm horizontal multiplier equals 0.83 from table vm vertical multiplier equals 0.93 from table am asymmetric multiplier equals 0.90 from table fm frequency multiplier equals 0.75 from table next we can calculate the recommended weight limit or wl using the formula Pulling with a force of 350N, can result in a compressive force on the lumbar spine, of about 8000N, which is above the limit recommended by the US Naoyoshi. To prevent injuries, it is recommended, to make sure the area is level and clear of obstacles, push the load instead of pulling it. If there is limited movement, places a higher load on intervertebral discs, and can impair circulation of blood, and the supply of oxygen to muscles, and organs. On the other hand, dynamic work, where postures are alternated, helps prevent shortening of thigh muscles, improves blood flow, keeps intervertebral discs in good shape, and reduces the risk of vein weaknesses, and varicose veins. Key points on static work. Places a higher load on intervertebral discs. Impairs circulation of blood and supply of oxygen. To muscles and organs can lead to tension and longer recuperation times consequences of static work tension longer recuperation times high load on intervertebral discs impairment of circulation and oxygen supply to muscles and organs